This week on Kentucky Field, we celebrate a milestone. We are at beautiful Pine Mountain State Park in Bell County celebrating the 20th anniversary of the initial elk release back in Kentucky. We've gathered some of the people that were key in restoring the elk population. And we're going to dive into the stories behind Kentucky's elk restoration that you've probably never heard. But first, to understand why it's so important to bring this native species back, we need to know how they became extinct in Kentucky in the first place. Kentucky has been the center of heroic stories over the years, and this is certainly one for the history books. In 1850, an era was nearing its end. The presence of elk across the countryside. With hardly more than 900,000 people in our state, more wildlife called the bluegrass home than farm families, but not for long. On the rolling landscape, the very last of our native eastern elk were being hunted out. These were the days of unregulated hunting, giving many the notion that wildlife was in endless supply. In reality, not just our majestic elk, but white-tailed deer, bison, black bear, and many other animals were paying a price. Fast forward 150 years. The Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife is long established, setting season dates, harvest limits, and following through on a quest to restore species eliminated from earlier days. With success under its belt already with deer, river otter, peregrine falcon, bald eagles, and the wild turkey, the next would be one of the largest game species on the continent, the Rocky Mountain Elk. Yeah, we got one, sweet. Got a muskrat? Yeah. Good job. <laughs> what do you know about that, man? That's a good fish, man. Nice male, small mouth, healthy, pretty color. Cody, here. Find us one more good pheasant, Cody. As biologists, we, we catch ducks and we place bands on them. And it's just a really excellent place to see cottonmouths. What do you think? Like bull. That was pretty fun. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Kentucky Field. I'm your host, Chad Miles. Have you ever wondered what it took to bring elk back to the state of Kentucky? From the very first time this whole idea was brought up to the 18 hour days of trapping elk out west, tonight we're gonna to hear the stories of how it all came together to create such an epic success. Joining me on the set today, I have Doug Hensley, former seventh district commission member. Sitting beside him, we have Tom Bennett, Fish and Wildlife Commissioner from 1993 till 2005. Right beside him, we have Roy Grimes. And Roy, you were the former Wildlife Division Director. Mm -hmm. And we have Dan Crank, Wildlife Biologist and Certified Elk Wrangler. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for joining me today, gentlemen. This is such a wonderful story, but a lot of people don't know exactly how this all came to be here in Kentucky. Whose idea was this and how did it all come about? I don't know, but it was the craziest idea I'd ever heard. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm blaming Doug and Tom Baker for it. I'm crediting Roy and Dan Crank and Charlie Logsman and John Tate and some other people who were critical to the process, but it, it really was a crazy idea at the time. I was off the commission for four years and I came back. And, I, and that, that's about the time that, that they released Elk and Lamb Between the Lakes mm -hmm. and I read it in the mm -hmm. paper. And I went into Tom's office and uh, Tom said, well, good to have you back. What do you want? I said, I want elk in East Kentucky. So that's the craziest thing I ever heard. That's, that's exactly what he First said. First thing I said was, is there any habitat? He said, well, yeah, there's plenty. 
later on I asked Roy, I said, how much do we need? And I think you said a million acres. Yeah, yeah. And I said, well, put, put John Phillips in a plane, send him out and see if he can find a million acres. And later on he came back and I said, well, tell me you didn't find a million acres. He said, we <laughs> yeah. didn't find a million acres. We found three. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> million acres. Yeah. A million acres. <laughs> yeah. And, and then I said, mm, this is not going to go well with Doug. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to have to put elk back in Kentucky. <laughs> The studies that took place and the public meetings to the very first day the elk hit the ground is a very short window. How much time was it? Oh, I'm guessing it was uh, 18 months before we really started started in implementing the the process. But it seemed like everything had just come together at the same time. We had vision from people who said, "Why not? Why can't we do that?" We had the professional resources to actually convince all the scientists and scientific sides of this that this could actually work. And then we had Tom Baker, who was the chapter president of the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation at the time, who convinced the Elk Foundation to put up a million dollars to make it happen. We couldn't have done that without that. Let's talk a little bit about that, because unfortunately Tom Baker is not able to be here with us. Uh, he has passed on, but uh, without Tom Baker and the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation, this project probably would have never happened. You, could take, you could take any of these pieces of this puzzle out of the, out of the works here, uh, and it wouldn't have happened. Yeah, to do it on the scale it needed to be done on, it was going to be very expensive. And of course, that's one of our huge concerns because we're fund the department's funded only by licensed buyers and uh, you know, sportsmen and women pay for the bills and that's a big bill, a million bucks is what we thought it'd cost. And Tom Baker solved that issue for us right away. All we had to do was figure the rest of it out. That's right. Doug, you're actually from the area in which these elk are, they're, they're there today. And uh, so you had a lot of your neighbors, your friends, your family members, I'm sure, that were either really interested in this project or had a whole lot of questions. How did you handle that? When I went to club meetings and started uh, putting that out, well, would you like to have elk in East Kentucky? They thought I was crazy too. <laughs> Everybody, you know, I was kind of out there by myself, but the one thing that happened was I surrounded myself with a good team. I had John Tate with the mining industry, I had Paul Van Boeven with the UK, had Tom Baker with the Elk Foundation, and I had some of the commission members, and I had enough support that we allowed the Fish and Wildlife to do the study. That happened in December before, before we stocked them. And, and, uh, and uh, when, when Tom came up, when we figured out the issue of the money, and uh, I, I never will forget the call that I made to Tom Baker. And I said, Mr. Baker, I, you know, my name's Doug Hensley. I s serve on the Fish and Wildlife Commission. Everybody tells me I got a crazy idea about stocking elk in East Kentucky. What do you think? He said, well, we did it in Lamb Between the Lakes. And I said, well, this is a little different. And he said, well, what do you want me to do? And I said, I want you to pay for it. And he said, okay. <laughs> He said, okay. A, a typical Tom Baker he, response. Yeah, right? <laughs> he said, okay. I mean, and I said, well, before you say okay, why don't you come up and let us show you what, what we're doing. And he brought some people from the Elk Foundation. They came up, John Tate rolled us around. From Montana they came. The, yeah, yeah, the, yeah and, and rolled us around the, the mine site. And uh, they said, these will work here. This will work. This will work. And uh, boy, that's all it took. And, and uh, Tom went back to the board and, presented the case to the board of directors for the Elk Foundation and they wrote a check for a million bucks. You have great support, but everyone knows any, anytime you got a project that dealing with the general public, there's always barriers too. Let's talk a little bit about some of the barriers. Obviously we had a financial barrier. You told us how we, how we got around that. What other barriers did we have? We, in, internally in the department, we, we, we're, we stayed in good contact with the public all the time about l almost everything we did. So we knew what some of the science barriers would be. We had to, there would be disease issues we need to make sure. Would the elk survive? Parasite problems, for example. And we knew the public would be concerned about uh, competition with livestock, with croplands, damaging fences. One, the public even at one meeting said, we're concerned about dogs. You know, would the dogs end up chasing the elk and, and, causing pro and, and causing problems for the elk? They were worried about the elk and the dogs. I remember calling Pennsylvania and asking them about that one when I had that list. They said, well, the only time we've ever heard of a dog conflict, the dog lost. <laughs> it was chasing the elk and the elk turned on the dog. So yeah. we, were, we were able to, we were okay with the dog thing. And then when we presented the idea to the March commission meeting, the commission said, yeah, let's, let's pursue the idea further and let's see what the public thinks and get some hard numbers on that. We ended up with 1,300 responses from Eastern Kentucky folks. 99% were in favor of the project. 
and then we receive responses from the rest of the state, and 90, oh, 3,300 responses total, 90% of the rest of the state were for it, even though it wasn't in their backyard. So I don't know that we had ever done much that had as strong a public support as this project. We were, we were very pleased. Where all did we get elk from? There was many states involved in, us in, in shipping elk to Kentucky, correct? Yeah. We, we got them from, the, fir the first elk came from Kansas, and, and Tom can tell that story because that was the toughest, the first release was the toughest one to put together, not work-wise, but, but getting the wise. logistics Politics, of it. Politics-wise. I'm and sure they just put a UPS sticker on there and shipped them on. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> go to Amazon and they'll drop that thing, you know, and probably do that today. But Kansas was first, and we had Utah, New Mexico, Arizona, Oregon, and uh, North Dakota, where, where the elk came from those places. And so we ended up bringing in, what was it, 1,549 yep. animals, I think, yep. totally. 1,549. So you needed a, a bunch of states, because I'm sure that going out and just locating an elk and putting it in a trailer and bringing it back it's, cannot be an easy proposition. No, it's not easy. How, how, how do you go about doing that? These, I mean, these are wild animals, right? So we're not, we're not talking about going to somebody's farm and saying, which ones are you going to get rid of? You're going out and trapping wild animals in other states and shipping them back to Kentucky, right? Right, we basically went to states that had surplus animals, pretty much, or, or they were in places that uh, they couldn't hunt them to the population level they wanted them. Mm -hmm. So we came in, uh, you know, basically January through 1st of March, somewhere in there, um, and set up our traps and, and started catching them. Describe that trap so people will know that the elk is uh, corralled. Uh, rather it's, than... it's basically a 10 by 10 gate panel, pretty much, and you put about 10 of them together in a circle, it has a one-way door or a door opening in it that has a trip wire. When the elk go in, they hit the trip wire, the door shuts behind them. And it's basically random. You can catch two, you can catch 15. You just don't know. But they had to be checked every single day. There was no cameras yeah, exactly. back then to no, tell you. No cameras, no remote cell phone cameras or any of that kind of stuff. So, you know, we, we, had to, we stayed in one place where we held the elk. It was a three-hour drive every morning to go check the trap. Whether there was something in it or not, you had to do it every day. Um, if there was elk in it, you'd load them, you'd rebait it, and drive back. And by the time you got back, it was, you know, four or five o'clock at night, and you had to, you know, go take care of those elk, too. You had to feed them and water them and, and check on them and all that. And it was basically a, a rinse and repeat every day for three months. That's they had to be did. held several days to go through some of these disease tests, like TB. Right. But basically, we had to catch about 70 was a semi-load. Okay. So you may catch them in a week, you may catch them in two or three weeks. Uh, depending on on how things went. Did you ever get to see a release in Kentucky? Because you were one. I, I saw one when I worked at UK. Yeah. So you were involved <laughs> in handling all these elk and trapping them. But I mean, you're putting them on a tractor trailer and saying, right. "See you later," and going back out and getting more. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And based on see. their personal relationships and and the professional relationships they had, there were some states that were very eager to give us elk. Mm -hmm. So we were we were guessing. I think I was anyway that some of these states thought that we were crazy yeah. to take these to take these animals. We wanted they were glad, 200 a year. Yeah, they were glad to get rid of them. So yeah, Everybody thought we were crazy. Well, I bring that up because it really set the stage for how this restoration took place. It was a restoration that was taking place for hunting purposes. Hunting we and wildlife viewing. We were mm -hmm. bringing elk into mm -hmm. the state of Kentucky with the intent to hunt, but we also didn't recognize at the time that the economic tourism that was going to develop because of it. I, well, I, th I think we did recognize that. Oh, really? And I think that was, that was one of the big selling points to the, to the legislature and to the commission. And, and real fast, we, we recognized because people were ringing my phone off the hook. I want to see elk. I, I could have I took, and you too, Dan. That's what I did for about two years. Yeah, I mean, all <laughs> well, we, we did was haul people years. out there to show them elk. I mean, yeah. it, it was, it, it, it would have been a thriving business. And see, we learned some of that from Pennsylvania. We, yeah. One of the things we did, we identified all the states in the east that used to have elk just like we did. They're native to everywhere except Florida and southern Georgia, but they've been gone from most of those places for about as long as they were gone here. But when we contacted Pennsylvania, they had a very popular wildlife viewing herd. So popular, in fact, that when they needed to be hunted in order to be managed, controlled, they couldn't get public support for it because they were so important as a viewing. So we decided we better make sure we don't make that mistake. So as soon as we have a restoration, part of the restoration mm -hmm. zone, uh, have a herd that can support itself and support hunting, we, did hunt, we hunted it early to remind the public this is the it's sports, sportsmen and women are paying for this project and they will be some of the users that benefit from it. Tell me a little bit about the very first, the very first elk release. So we got the first nine animals came from, our folks went out there and captured them and disease tested them. The first nine were put on a truck, 
to come here to be released in December the 17th uh, before Christmas in front of 4,500 people. We had just about every officer in the state up here and had 30, I think 31 busloads of kids that come in and we'd put an officer on each bus at the bottom of the hill and they'd explain to the kids the program when they were going up. Chad, it was unbelievable. When those elk came out, of course we had the governor, Paul Patton was opening the door. I'll tell you a story about that. I was at a funeral uh, and Paul Patton was there and he came up to me and he said, Doug, he said, you know, uh, we, I'm, I've been here and we've having a little problem with elk, you know, a few elk are getting in trouble and everything. And I said, he, and I said, well, governor, you just want to turn them loose. <laughs> <laughs> now he he the just door. laughed, he, he was just kidding. But anyway, it was amazing, I, you know. Uh, that was the only daytime release we ever did, by the way, for the public. Yes. So Dan, when they sent you out there, to Utah to trap 200 elk a year, and you're like, wow, this is going to be a heck of an undertaking. And when you got the phone call and said, instead of 200, we want 500 or 600, <laughs> what can what, you get us? <laughs> what, did, what went through your mind? Because you were spending these long hours traveling three hours back and forth. Did you think you could pull it off? Well, I think, we, yeah, we, we could, you know. It, it, but we needed a little bit of help for these other states to, to jump on board. And because, you know, like I said, some, sometimes you'd have warm weather and you couldn't catch it. Cause sometimes it'd be 40 below and you'd catch them like crazy. Is it true Charlie Lawson created a snow dance? Not a rain he, dance, he, but a snow dance. He may dance. have. <laughs> <laughs> so and the reason did. the cold weather is because you're, you're baiting them into areas to trap and they would respond to the bait if, the, right. if it was yeah, harder to get we, the food We basically source, right? needed the coldest, coldest we could get. You know, If it was below zero, all the better. The deeper the snow, all the better. Because uh, it was harder for them to, to find food resources. Mm -hmm. So we put a big pile of hay out there mm -hmm they're gonna to come to that pretty fast. So now we're catching elk at you know, five and 600 a year, and we're trapping them back from all kinds of different Western states. There had to have been some interesting stories on with elk and a big travel cattle trailer coming mm. back to Kentucky. Ooh, Ooh the, very the very first one was the, was the one. <laughs> yeah, um, a long night. The lost, <laughs> the lost truck. The lost truck. This truck was supposed to be back to Kentucky in I think 18 or 20 hours. Okay. And. 24 hours in, I, I think I got a call from yeah, Roy, yeah, yeah, and he we says, at it. <laughs> he says um, we don't know where the truck is. It's, it's gone. So how many elk are on this the trailer? This is the first load now. This is, not, this is after the seven go out, yeah. and now this is the very first load Big in load. Yeah. after that. Yeah. And, and we, it's missing. We sweated for about 36 hours. Yeah. Didn't know where the truck was, had no idea. Are we going to end up with a store here, 70 dead elk on a, on a truck someplace? The first one. And I know the next, the next day, now we're over a day late here on these things, and I'm in Paducah, headed to Paducah from Frankfurt. My wife calls, and she said they found the truck, and where they found the truck, the fellow had gone to, the story we heard was that the fellow had gone to sleep and he was a sound sleeper. Um, so <laughs> after that, we changed our protocol. <laughs> Two drivers were required, and law enforcement, our own law enforcement here, volunteered to send a chaperone. Every time a truck came back, they made sure it got here on time, and they ran interference. In Indiana, my favorite story is uh, they were coming through Indiana on I-64, almost home, and I uh, got a call from uh, the, uh, uh, the officer, and he said, uh, Indiana patrolman, uh, pulled us over, and the, the elk will stick their tongues out when it's raining out of the slats of the cattle truck. And she said, they look thirsty, and I want you to let them out of the truck. This, this is a whole, herd, a whole bunch of elk, and let them water in the ditch here along I-64. <laughs> Um, so they, they weren't going to do that. They would have quit their job. Yeah, yeah, right. So they called and I, I said, let, let me talk to her. Now she, um, the patrolman, I think, you know, we're Kentucky and I don't, maybe she didn't think we knew what we were doing. I don't know, but I convinced her, you know, told her about the project, the scale and all the research that went in it, what's going on. And she was maybe coming around a little bit, but not quite. And then when I told her, I said, Indiana's going to have the largest elk herd in the eastern United States if you let these go. Plus, you're going to have some accidents on this road. So they, they let us go then, but it would have been a mess. Every time after that, we, uh, one of our officers escorted the truck from the site back to Kentucky. This is one of those learning things because had something really gone wrong on that, on that very first trip, yeah. it could have, it could have oh, yeah. stalled the program or, or ended it the right then. truck had then wrecked there. or whatever. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Chad, we learned from day one and, and have tweaked it for 20 years. Oh, yeah. And I, you learn something every, every year and you keep tweaking and tweaking until you try to get it right. Well, this very first, the very first load that came in, there was a, there was a pretty decent sized bull on that, mm -hmm. on that particular load as well. Bull number four from yeah, Kansas. Number four. Bull number four. He, he'll go down in infamy. Well, yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. Tell us a little bit about what happened with bull number four. Well, we had um, cameras. The, the Kentucky field crew was, was down close to the trailer. The public was about 150 yards away because we didn't know what was going to happen. Right. The first time a gate was open, when the governor opened the gate, what these elk would do. And we didn't want them running in the crowd. Yeah, yeah. So uh, the, 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 uh, the truck was open. Six elk ran out of the truck and ran up on a grassy hill. And you've seen the picture. You guys took the picture, I imagine, of those six elk looking back at those yeah. 4,500 people. It was a color picture in the Lexington Herald the next day but six there's supposed to be another live elk in there and it was bull number four and he had a big tag in his ear bull number four he's a big old bull from from kansas tried to get him out they did everything they could to get him out took 45 minutes to get him out they uh, we we're about ready to send biggin in for him <laughs> but before we did that we threw they, the guys threw a white plastic bucket in there figuring that to spook him out and he just tore that white bucket to pieces but finally you know we're learning we all backed away from the trailer and every ever ever livestock owner watching this show will say well duh we finally backed <laughs> yeah. away from the trailer bull number four got okay and he went on out but he went a totally different direction than those six cows did and he went he was headed to Cincinnati so we, and at out. this time they were all radio collars so oh, we yeah. could track where they were going oh, yeah. and try to figure out what lands they were using that was one of the deals yeah. I think that was a deal Tom made that we'll put a radio collar on every single elk we bring in, uh, in the be in for hundreds of them. Now, and that's so we'd know where they are, and if we needed to go get them, we could find them. Now, some of our peers in the, in the wildlife profession in other states, they asked me if we'd ever heard of statistics. You don't have to radio collar everything <laughs> in order to know what they're doing, but they didn't understand the, you know, the, the, the uh, ramifications of dealing with the public. After this project was public, after that first winter, uh, we would go to regional meetings and national meetings and our counterparts from the surrounding border states of Kentucky, I, I felt a couple of smirks now and then. Mm -hmm. Like, you guys are really trying to, you think you're really going to bring elk back to East Kentucky? Are you serious, really? <laughs> and they, they were kind and they were polite and listened to our proposals. Now we've got Virginia and West Virginia Tennessee. North, North Carolina and Tennessee, yeah. who have all done their their programs based on the work that, that uh, our, and, our and, team did. And many of their elk came from this herd. Dan's probably been involved in catching some of our elk and now sending, because ours are so well monitored from a disease standpoint, that they're very safe to take to other states. Well, and since then, just in the last five or 10 years now, we've got Wisconsin and Missouri as well, mm -hmm. right? Yep, so yep, Missouri too. We have become the location with a very, very uh, clean mm -hmm. elk herd. Yep. And the numbers here can support giving right. some, right. Right. we don't want to send the big bulls, but we'll send the, the, cow, the cows and spikes just like we've done. Well, this was obviously, a, it's a huge success story, and we're in our 20th year since the, since the elk release. And we're going to do several stories throughout the year this year about elk in the state of Kentucky, all the way from today's our release show. We're going to talk about how the elk are doing, all the way up to hunting and maybe some calf capturing. So this is, this is show number one to really celebrate 20 years of elk in Kentucky. Now, in the end, really, these elk are here and they're doing well because of the citizens of this state. If they had t hadn't told us they're for it, we'd have had a real hard time doing the it. The most important partner we had, and we had a lot of partners, and a lot of the lines, the stars aligned on this project, there's no question. We got lucky on several occasions, but the most important partner that we had was the people. Yeah. And if they hadn't accepted it, you, you're not gonna have population. And you've got to keep those people informed about what's going on, you've got to you've got to promote the elk and keep them interested because, like you say, kids are coming up and they thought we've always had them. They don't realize what went into getting those things. That's a great point about because one of the concerns the public had was poaching of the elk. Would the elk be allowed to flourish because of poachers? So that was part of the presentation. You know, this is your program, your project, and the, the world is watching, at least the conservation world is watching. We need you to protect, and the governor, Governor Patton at that time, that's, right. that's he what him, he said He had them right between yeah, the eyes with that right. the very first day we released them. Right. Right. And made probably the best speech, contemporaneous speech he's ever made. Talk about taking ownership of these animals. Those there. elk, are, these are your elk. And then the following legislature passed some legislation which, which put in place severe penalties for poaching elk. We had known poachers turning in people who were uh, uh, taking advantage of the elk. They were protecting them that way. 20 years into, into elk restoration here in the state of Kentucky, what a successful story it has been. And I want to personally thank you all for your parts that you've played in this. And I wish everyone that had played a part could, uh, could be here. Yeah, this room would be overflowing. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. For a Fish and Wildlife Agency, um, 
preventing an animal from going extinct is probably the greatest thing we can do. The second greatest thing is returning something that has been extirpated. And so this was a, a joy for us to be able to have the privilege to have done this. And Dan still gets to work with them. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> well, there are some wildlife viewing opportunities. I hope those continue to grow. Me too. And, uh, and, and allow more people to come to Eastern Kentucky and spend a little bit of time, see how beautiful the scenery is. Get up there on a mountain uh, and, and check out one of these elk because it really is something you will never forget. That's right. So thanks a lot, guys. I appreciate you all coming. Thanks for doing this. All right. it's, good, it's good to see you all. Good to see you guys again.